Greetings from Puerto Vallarta. It's um, a nice little town down south. You guys get a chance to come visit. We'd love to have you. We are blessed to be a part of this fellowship. And um, worship wasn't so bad either. <laughs> kind of like the worship team. Did an awesome job, actually. And we, are, and we're, we come to learn as much as we do to fellowship. We, uh, we see so many great things going on in this fellowship as far as not only the way you guys are fellowshipping and loving one another, but operating together as a fellowship. The outreach you guys have been doing, especially during the time of COVID, it's been amazing to see. Uh, and at the conference, we, we were just blessed. So thank you for um, allowing us to be a part of that. So tonight, <laughs> your Q&A is next week. You're probably going to want to ask a lot of questions about what was he talking about. But we're going to be covering... Ezekiel 38 and 39 tonight, and it's going to be a challenge for me because I like to cover 38 like in two weeks and 39 in about two weeks to go into detail on these things, but we're going to give it a shot. I've entitled the message, Behold, it is coming and it shall be done, kind of stole it from chapter 39. That is the verse there. And at first glance, when you look at these chapters, they can seem really confusing. There's different points of view on these chapters. So when we are talking about these events, we need to be a little bit open-minded, not completely dogmatic, but we want to look at these things and, and ask the Lord to give us guidance and to help us understand these things. You know, there's a lot of churches that won't touch prophecy, and they won't touch Ezekiel 38 and 39. It says they, they, they say it's too mystical. It's too hard to understand. Um, and most of us are just working to try and feed our families. We want to come to church. We want to hear about Jesus and get blessed. And so people will come up to me sometimes because um, I love prophecy. And they'll say, you know, I don't get it. What's all the big deal about all this prophecy? And why is it important for me to understand it? And I, I was one of those people. Uh, very much so as a new believer, I was like, you know, I love Jesus. And that's all that there was for me at that time. But in 1986, I had the opportunity to be a part of a ministry up in Europe. We were going all over the place, ministering, doing evangelism. And I was in Helsinki, Finland. And we were doing ministry. And I met this crazy group of Christians and they came to me and said, yeah, we have this ministry. And, and they, I said, well, we do evangelism. You know, we are out in the streets sharing the Lord. What do you guys do? And they said, oh, we're praying. And we have a, we have a warehouse. And we're storing up food and blankets. And we have clothing. And we have access to ships. And we're waiting for the Jews. I said, you're what? Yeah, read your Bible. It says that, that there's going to come a time when the Lord is going to release the Jews from up north. And they're going to be able to flood back into Israel. And I looked at him and I said, when was that prophecy written? And they're like, oh, you know, it's like 2,500 years ago. And I'm going, you guys, wait a minute. You guys are here right now planning for this prophecy that was written thousands of years ago to be completed. They said, yeah. Now, there had been initial release or return in 19, in the 70s, in the early 70s. But that died off. They were now in prayer and they were, they were, they were confident. And I was like, you guys are out of your mind. You know, you should just be focusing on Jesus. Of course they were. But I went home after that <clears throat> and I went back to school and I was pursuing a ministry focus and they, I kept it in the back of my mind. And all of a sudden, just barely three years later, the Berlin Wall comes down. And I was thinking, this is amazing. And I was right on the Russian border in Finland. I got to tour the Russian border. I got to see the, car, the guard towers and I could see the difference. Um, I saw, I met Christians who had snuck out of Russia to, to meet us and to fellowship with us. And I thought, this is amazing. Those guys had the faith to believe that a prophecy that was thousands of years ago could come true in our time. And I'm seeing prophecy being fulfilled right before my eyes. And it seems like the church is being blind to this. They're not open. They're not looking for this. And I started thinking about, man, this is what happened in Jesus's time. The, all the prophecies pointed to the coming of Jesus for the first coming, but they're all buried in their, in, in their law and in their Bibles, but they weren't looking for the signs. So, well, what I hope we can see tonight as we look into 
The most famous of Ezekiel's prophecy, 38 and 39, is that the events described here about this major war that's going to come in the Middle East are not allegorical. They are not purely symbolic, but this war is real and it is closer than most of us can even imagine. And the one thing that God wants us to know is that, and he's going to be stating this as we see here and in, in, again in chapter 39, is that it's coming. I mean, he says it dogmatically, doesn't he? He says, behold, it is coming and it shall be done. That's a double statement. It is going to happen, declares the Lord. This is the day which I've spoken, Ezekiel 39 verse eight. So it is coming, it, it will happen. But the good news is, is that that means if that battle is about to happen, and again, I'm thinking back to my experience of having it only three years after I was first exposed to it. That means everything in the world is gonna change. And that means that we're gonna go home. Whatever happens related to that war is directly related to us and what happens here, what happens in our, in our walk with the Lord even now. So before we look into these verses, let's just ask the Lord to pray and bless this time that we're going to spend together and ask him to open up our minds and our hearts to kind of gain an understanding of two of the chapters that are, have been historically very difficult for churches to really kind of wade through and get a full understanding. So Father, thank you for this time and ask you would bless it as we come here together as a group, God, it's just your servants. I ask you to, to teach us and to guide us. And um, God, we're, we're privileged to have the revealed future and your truth given to us. And so God, we ask that now you would um, just guide us through your word and show us these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the chapter's laid out pretty straightforward. Really, I simplified it for my own, my own benefit. Uh, you can break it down in a lot of different ways with subcategories, but I basically saw it as Ezekiel's prophecy is the judgment of God against Gog, the protection and restoration of Israel, and God's ultimate purpose in bringing about this war. And this is what the two chapters are, are ultimately getting at. So verse one says, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face towards Gog of the land of Magog and the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and, again, and prophesy against him. Chapter 37, many of you remember, is that beautiful chapter uh, of Israel coming back together. Now remember, Ezekiel is writing to a bunch of exiles. They're in captivity, and they're bummed out. I mean, they're, their homeland's been destroyed. The temple's been destroyed, and they're there. And all of a sudden, Ezekiel comes in. He says, guess what, guys? God's going to bring it all back together. The land is going to come back together, just like the bones in the dry valley are going to come back together and be covered with flesh. We as a nation are going to be revived. We're going to come back. And that would have been great if he stopped there. But he didn't. He goes on into 38 and he says, and he's telling me again, these poor captives that have no country and they have been beaten down and, and, and conquered by the Babylonians. He says, but know this, that there's gonna come a time in the future that when you are regathered, that a war is gonna break out again. In fact, there's gonna be another invasion, which was like, oh man, it probably bummed them out. But the invasion that he's talking about here is the one that we wanna define carefully and take a look at tonight because there is a tendency whether right or wrong, for people to equate this invasion with Armageddon. Most of us know a lot about the Battle of Armageddon or if we've heard about it, even non-Christians know about Armageddon. You get all the movies with the title about Armageddon. They don't have a full understanding, but they know that the one great last battle is gonna be Armageddon. So we tend to confuse these two. And do, there are many good scholars that do think these two are one and the same. I wanna suggest to you that I think they're different. I think there's a separation and I think that the Gog, the, the battle that we're going to come and see that Ezekiel is going to describe is best described as Gog, of the battle of Gog and Magog. And so the question obviously right away is who's Gog and who's Magog or what's Magog? And how, how do you figure all this stuff out? Well, fortunately, we have theologians, Bible historians, people that know languages 
And they break this down for us. And when you look into secular history, many historians have noticed that Gog generally is used as a, more of a title than it is a name, a leader of a people. And Gog has been linked to an ancient group of, called the Scythians. Many of you have learned about them, have heard about them before. I'm sure probably Pastor Mark has taught on them. But they, they lived up in the north in the area which is today known as Russia. Magog is just a combination of the two words, uh, May and Gog. May is, means land of and Gog. So it is the land of Gog, who is just some kind of a ruler. And then also Ezekiel calls him the Prince of Rosh. Now, some people have concluded, and other people get upset when you, when you say this, but some people say, well, the word Rosh is the ancient name for Russia. And I get on, I started reading a lot of different theologians said, no, you can't do that. It's wrong. You can't do that with the entomology. It's different. It's blah, blah, blah. And they have other good explanations on why. But regardless of whether that name applies, he also talks about Meshach and Tubal. And there's a lot more agreement that Meshach may well be and probably is the ancient name for Moscow. Moscow and Tubal is the ancient name for the modern city of Tublask, Tublask, or Tublask, if I can pronounce it correctly, both cities up in Russia. And I have friends that don't hold these views completely, but I think it is the most agreed upon view right now of the land of the north. And if you look at the land of the north, what's north of Israel? If you go to the far north, you're going to find out you're going to run right into Russia. And so we have this description of the ruler of this land that is up into the north. We have the cities named. And what we're gonna find out is God has a lot to say about this place and about this ruler. This is a prophecy, this is kind of encouraging that Ezekiel is giving to the people in captivity about his judgment upon the people of the north in their future. So it's going to give them a little encouragement because they're used to getting the, the condemnation on themselves for the sin they're doing. But now God says, no, I'm holding, I'm reserving judgment for Magog and for the prince of Magog there. So verse three and four says, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws and I will bring you out and, and all your armies, Horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords. So Ezekiel would have understood that God, what God had meant because uh, for the Babylonians and the Assyrians to come down and, and take them down into captivity, what he meant was he said, just as they had done to you to put the hooks in your jaw and pulled you down out of Israel into this land that you are now occupying down in Babylon, I'm gonna do to the north. Because literally in those days, if you look in, in history, they had this really gory but very effective way of taking their prisoners off to their country. They would just come and put a big hook under your jaw and, and hook it to the people in front of you and uh, it was rather painful if you didn't keep pace with the rest of the group that was being exported. So God is saying, I'm going to do that to you, Magog, and I'm going to pull you down into Israel for the purpose of being judged by God. Verse 5 and 6 says, Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all of its troops, Beth Togarma from the remote parts of the north with all its troops, many peoples with you. We know who Persia is today. Persia is Iran. Ethiopia, Ethiopia may be connected to one or two other parts of neighboring countries in North Africa. Libya, uh, also Northern Africa, still known today. Gomer uh, is most likely a reference to East Germany, Poland, and some Eastern European countries. Uh, Gomer, I had a different perspective of, but the latest theologians I've been checking on seem to point towards East Germany, which is again, very interesting in light of my experience of seeing the wall of Berlin come down and the Jews being able to leave any part of the Soviet Union that was under their control at that time. Beth Tugarma, is modern day Turkey. 
So what we see here is these nations around Israel are going to come against Israel in battle with all their military and all of their weapons of war. And it's quite a coalition. And this would have been quite an interesting thing to hear. One nation is hearing that there's going to be this an enormous coalition of armies that are going to be brought down for the purpose of fighting them. This is God's decree. Verse seven through nine says, be prepared and prepare yourself, you and all your companies that are assembled about you and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be summoned. In the latter years, you will come into the land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which have been a continual waste. But his people were brought out from the nations and they are living securely, all of them, You will go up, you will come like a storm, you will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. God tells them, get ready. I'm going to make you come and fight against Israel. And there's a coming day when they would be summoned to come against the people of Israel that have now been regathered themselves from many nations and are now living securely in the land. And the amazing thing about this prophecy is its accuracy. It was given 2,500 years ago. And we look at this today and you go, you know, that's Israel today. There are many people from many nations that have been regathered together to form a nation and they're now living securely in the land. Not only are they living security, uh, securely, but they, um, they're still regathering from all over the place. And I'm gonna to get to this thing about securely because you're, you're wondering, are they really secure or not? But they're living securely because of their military, but also because they have a destiny that God has decreed in prophecy. God has decreed that this is gonna happen, this war. And so up until this war comes, God is using them and they have a specific purpose and they are to help us understand how God is active within, through the Bible, in our days. And that when we read these things, when we read these prophecies and these scriptures, we can get excited because we know that God is real. He's, he's doing things in our day. We're seeing prophecies being fulfilled before our eyes. If we're sensitive to it, we can see it and we can sense it. Some of you know that Iran historically has never had an alliance with Russia. Persia, as its ancient name was, never has had an alliance with Russia until the last few years. They were always enemies. Turkey has always had good relationships with Israel until recently, until Erdogan started messing things up. And they used to be strongly pro-Western, pro-democracy, and now they're shifting much more to the Islamic bent and becoming more and more anti-West and anti-Israel. Ethiopia, Ethiopia, excuse me, has had a conflict, has had several conflicts with Israel and Libya has sanctioned terrorism for years against Israel. And in ancient times, none of these countries would have had any reason to unify with the land of the north, for for the most part, they were hostile towards each other. And here we're seeing Ezekiel tell us they're gonna all come together with one common purpose, one goal, to destroy Israel. How much of that sounds familiar today? How much of that are we seeing in the news today? There is one thing that's not defined in Ezekiel that has been developing for the last couple thousand years, a little less, and that's Islam. Islam has been the one factor that has been unifying these countries and are still unifying these countries today. And we're seeing it on the rise and we're seeing increase, especially when you consider Turkey and what's going on with there with Erdogan. Now, the way that this army is going to come upon Israel says here, in verse nine is that they're gonna come like a storm cloud to overwhelm the number of troops that Israel has. They're gonna think, they're, they're gonna think in their minds that we're just gonna blow through Israel and destroy it like in a day or, or so. 
And your first thought reading this, if it's like mine, would be, okay, maybe I'm a good Bible prophecy student. I can believe this is going to happen, but I can't believe it's going to happen anytime soon. Not in my lifetime. Come on, this thing's 2,500 years old, this, this prophecy. But how many of you know that an invasion similar to this has already come very close to happening in Israel two to three times since 1948. They've already tried this two or three times and it's failed. Most of us know how the Arab nations attacked Israel when they were first established and they almost lost the war, 1948. Just after the reformation of Israel, of course, they were attacked by five Islamic nations along with the help of volunteer fighters from four other Muslim nations. So they were surrounded. They did, there was a coalition. They did come against Israel and Israel just barely defeated them. What a lot of us don't realize is what happened in 1973 and also in 1982. Renee and I had the, the blessing and the privilege of going up on the Golan Heights on one of our tours to Israel to listen to the story from our guide looking over the battlefield and some of the blown up tanks and the things around of the story of what happened back in 1973 when Israel was attacked on Yom Kippur on their holy day. Russia, who Ezekiel calls Magog, Russia in 1973 supplied some 1,400 to 1,600 tanks to Syria. That's more tanks than the Germans used on Russia in World War II. There's an enormous amount of tanks. And those tanks came from where? From the north. To do what? To invade Israel. The Russians were supplying Syria and helping them, watching them, hoping they'd be able to sweep down like a storm, like a storm cloud and overwhelm them. That was the plan. That's why they did it on Yom Kippur. They knew they'd all be celebrating. They wouldn't be paying attention. But an amazing thing happened. Israel was totally caught off guard. They were celebrating their holy day. They were feasting and, and all of their soldiers were not up on the Golan Heights. In fact, they had them down on the south. They thought if anything was gonna happen, it was gonna happen on the south, uh, not up on the north. So the northern border up on the Golan Heights was defenseless. And the Syrian tanks came up, came up to the Golan Heights. They were on their way up there and they realized that there was, there was no resistance. Nobody was fighting. They seemed too easy. They thought, hey, wait a minute. If it's this easy, we must be coming into a trap. We got to stop and think about this. So they all stopped. The tank commander stopped the whole invasion of all those tanks to find out more information about why they were not encountering resistance from the Israeli army. So they listened and they were having, in, apparently they were having some difficulty with communications with the home office, we will say. Finally, the Israelis realized, hey, wait a minute, there's tanks up there. We got to get, mobilize our, our forces and get up north. So they, they started to go up there. And while they're on their way up there, the Syrians began to be concerned about what the United Nations was going to think about them invading Israel. They thought, that's not going to look so good on the public relations sides of things. We need a false flag. I know what we'll do. We will get on the radio in Damascus and tell the world that Israel's invading us. And that way, it'll look like we're just defending ourselves. So they got on Damascus radio and they say, we're being invaded and the Israeli tanks are coming in. And so the tank commanders, trying to figure out what was going on, heard the radio in their tanks and they freaked out. They said, they're attacking Damascus. So the tank commanders order all the tanks to turn around and they go flying back to Damascus to defend the cities. And of course, they weren't being attacked. But by that time, Israel was mobilized their forces up to the north and they were ready. And the attack, the whole thing fell apart. Why did it fall apart? Because God protected Israel. God had not yet summoned Russia to come and fight Israel. It came very close though. Very close in 1948, it came very close in 1973. And most of us don't even remember it or think about it. Go to Israel up in the Golan Heights and you'll get a whole long explanation of it. And how God came through miraculously. There's some amazing stories of how God did miracles to keep that invasion at bay and not coming. Again, 1982, even less known by many people, 
when Israel had to go in to invade Lebanon, when Lebanon was coming against them, and we know what's going on with Hezbollah and everything going on in Lebanon, they went in to fight against Lebanon, and they had no idea what they were going to find. They went in, they found an enormous cache of arms, rifles, explosives, grenades, everything to launch an attack. They also found plans to invade Israel and some plans to fight against the United States. They had plans for a, from the attack was to come from the north on Israel, while at the same time, they were gonna poison their water reservoirs and the weapons were Russian made from the land of ancient Magog. There was enough weapons to supply 13 divisions of soldiers now I read this and I still, I, I, I'm quoting out of an article I read, it's still hard for me to wrap my mind around if this is true, but it says it took the Israelis five months to remove all the arms from the place where they were stored in their secret cave or their secret cache that nobody knew about except Hezbollah and Iran and Russia and those who were trying to invade. But the plan was to come from the north like a storm cloud. Once again, Russia and her companion countries had plans to invade Israel, but they were not summoned yet because God is the protector of Israel and he's not gonna allow Israel to be touched until he summons them from these countries and allows them to attack Israel. And he says in there, in Ezekiel says, there will be a day in the future when this is, I'm going to allow this. So what this should tell us is that there are people who every single day have been planning how they can come and attack Israel like a swarm, like a cloud in order to wipe them out. Ever since 1948, there is a demonic spirit behind this, this drive to do whatever they can and they will not relent. And not only is it demonic, it's also God ordained. Now up to this point, the motivation for attacking, for attacking Israel has largely been religious and geographic. Islam wants to dominate the Middle East. They can't stand the fact that there are Jews living amongst them that are being prosperous and that to them are infidels. In fact, Iran today is made up of mostly of Shia Muslims and they have a belief that their Messiah cannot come back until they create a holy war with Israel and even the United States. So their motivation has always been demonic, really, and, and their desire has been to wipe them out for their glory of Allah and their God. But now look in verse 10 through 12. It says here, thus says the Lord God, it will come about on that day that thoughts will come into their minds and you will devise an evil plan. And you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will against those who are at rest that live securely, all of them living without walls, having no bars or gates and capture spoil and to seize plunder and to turn your, your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited and against the people who are gathered from the nations who have acquired cattle and goods and live at the center of the world. How interesting that Ezekiel sees a time in the future when this demonic influence over the leadership of Russia and of these other countries will say, let's go up against these cities of Israel who have no walls. Now, of course, in their day, it would be foolish, in Ezekiel's day, to ever live in a city without walls of protection. That was, that was your, your defense line. That was your, your whole strategy to defend your city was those big walls. It would be foolish, but it, we're seeing Ezekiel is looking into the future where there was a time where there was no walls. And we're talking walls around the city for the protection of the wall. Some people get carried away with the Gaza wall and that protection there, but this is a different issue. It's not walled cities. There are many, many, many cities in Israel with no walls. <laughs> Go to Tel Aviv. Go to Jerusalem even. There's no walls there. So Ezekiel is looking, he sees this, and he says, you know what? It's an, it's, it's an evil demise, it says. It's an evil plan. They don't want to go up for anything other than to capture spoil and seize plunder. So the, the idea is that is in Ezekiel's prophecy, it's not gonna just be about religion and not just be about ideology. It's gonna be about spoil and plunder. God is saying that Israel in the last day will be a nation of great wealth is what this is saying. And in Ezekiel's mind, a wealthy nation was one that had cattle, lots of good, lots of merchandise. 
And of course, we can see that we can see how the mind of the prophet is being given what he could understand. He could never understand cars and modern commerce. So God is saying, this is wealth. And he's seeing this in his mind. And the country also is situated geographically right in the center of the earth. Isn't it interesting that Israel was placed right there, right in the middle of of Asia and going up into Europe. And it was in, situated right in a perfect place. It's another reason why Israel is fought over even today. So many people looked at this and they say, okay, geographically, it is a good location between Asia and Africa. Uh, but what would it be that they would really come down for? I don't think they want cattle. <laughs> I don't think they need any sheep or cattle more than they already have. But notice a couple of things. First off is that these people are broken. They're living in Babylon. Their nation has been destroyed. And back in that time, destruction was destruction. And they had been away from the, you know, your land, away from your fields for 70 years. Nobody's there to take care of it. Almost nobody. And it really turned it in. It turned into a wasteland. There wasn't much there, but he, but he says, no, no, in the future, you're going to be prosperous. It's going to be amazing. So Israel's a nation again is what he's saying, obviously, to the, these um, deportees. And for that reason, many people have misinterpreted Ezekiel 38 and 39 for, for generations. Uh, ever since we started teaching on the New Testament, when the, when the established church got a hold of this, they go, well, it must be allegorical, must be symbolic. There is no Israel. And so <clears throat> you read your old, old, old commentaries. It takes a whole different view on Ezekiel because it, it was written before Israel was a nation. So Ezekiel said, no, you guys are going to be a nation again. The number two, Israel's wealthy. The wastelands would be turned from swamps and unusable land to something beautiful and productive. And Ezekiel, this would have been a beautiful thing for these deportees, these people that were in captivity to hear that they were going to have a country and it was going to be prosperous, it was going to be wealthy, and people were going to be desirous of what they had. Now, what do they have today? Well, they have wealth. They have an amazing amount of wealth. In fact, the income of the Israelis was going up dramatically up till COVID. They had a big crash there for a little while, but now it is going back up again and they're making a comeback. And, and they're making a strong comeback. Economically, they're strong even now, even at a time when the United States and Mexico and other nations, our economies are falling apart and people are losing jobs. Israel has 17 billionaires, 17. This is a country, the size, the size of New Jersey, it's half the size of my state of New Mexico, half the size. It's got 17 billionaires, it's got 88,000 millionaires. Their economy is the third largest in the world in, in terms of innovation. Third largest exporter, I think of flowers, uh, one of the greatest and uh, largest producers of fruit. Um, they have... 590 startup companies every year in technology. 500, way ahead of the United States, way ahead of even Japan. So what this verse, these verses are saying is that Russia and these other Islamic nations are going to invade the land more for the wealth than for the ideology. And just in the last 10 years, Israel has announced that they have 18 trillion cubic feet of natural gas just sitting off their, off their coast. That's, that's, that's mind-boggling. I can't even wrap my mind around 18 trillion cubic feet. They've already built the offshore drilling platform out there. Uh, interesting, I watched that whole thing. I don't know if you followed it when they, were, when they found it and they said, yeah, we're going to build an offshore platform. Russia was right there and said, oh, let us build it for you. I'd be happy to build that thing for you. And they uh, wisely turned them down. This is a phenomenal treasure of wealth. And this happened way after I started studying Ezekiel 38 and 39. So when the first time I, I heard about this, I was like, yes, it's just getting better. Every time you read chapter 38 and 39, you get more. It gets more, it gets more exact. You get, understand that it's, the prophecy is being fulfilled in our day, kind of year by year, almost month by month. Now they're building an underwater gas line over to Cyprus where they'll take the natural gas, will be liquefied and shipped over to Europe. Ask me later why they can't ship it all the way over to Europe or read up for it. It's a very interesting political thing they're dealing with. But 
Uh, what's interesting is consi to consider now they're already in the process of building this thing. They are already, th this is all starting to happen when? Right at a time when a certain government just blew up Russia's national, <laughs> natural gas line, causing one of the worst ecological disasters of all times, which nobody really wants to talk about. Could there be a connection to prophecy? If they are the land of the north, if they are Magog, and somebody's messing with their natural gas supply, which their, the wealth of their nation is based on, and then Israel's coming up with a new supply of natural gas being delivered to Europe, you decide if you think that's connected to Ezekiel 38 and 39. It is also su suspected that many of you probably have followed this, that there's a huge reserve of oil in Israel. I'll put the goal on heights. The realization is that they've been, is that now the Middle East is peaking on their oil production. And the Islamic nations now know that their oil is not gonna last forever and they're gonna run out. But Israel's just on the rise. I actually had a guy visit our church that was a uh, explorer for an oil company. He was one of the guys, the experts that go looking for oil to tell him if there's oil there or not. He said, he, he said, you know, the interesting thing is, he said, I was in Israel back in the late 80s and they paid me to go over there, they paid me a lot of money to go tell them if there was oil in the ground. And he said, I found it. I told him, yeah, you guys have a ton of oil in the ground. And I said, thanks. And they just sat on it. They didn't want anybody to know. Why? Because it wasn't the right time. It's not the time yet. God is not summoned. This is all going to be tying together very soon. So could this be the hook in the jaw of Russia? Russia has a huge dependency on oil and gas. They don't have any real oil of their own. They rely on the Islamic nations to provide it to them. What they do sell is their natural gas. And that's what's being messed with. Now, they are economically fine right now. But it is interesting that these things are coalescing. They're happening now at the same time from the north, from the south. With or without the oil and the natural gas being there, Magog, Russia, my estimation, will continue to join with these other Islamic nations to come against Israel like a storm in order to capture the wealth that they have using the pretext, in my opinion, of Islam. Using the pretext as a holy war in one sense, but they're going for the wealth because they need the stability. Russia needs the stability of, of selling the natural gas. They can't risk Israel you know, stealing the market and undercutting them and they need the oil. And if Israel all of a sudden has the oil and it's right there, and now we see how they've been moving their troops slowly but surely up to the Russian, up to the Israeli border there in Syria. When we were there last time, you know, our guide was saying, yeah, those are Iranians right down there and those are some Russians down there. And they have all of their, their spotters and all of their officers. They're all right there, right on the border. So while this attack is gonna go on from the north they're going to come and try and take whatever they can, thinking, yeah, we're doing this for our own benefit, for our own countries, for our own glory, or even for our own God. Verse 13 says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all their villages, will say to you, have you come to capture spoil? Have you assembled your company to seize plunder or to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods and to capture spoil? Sheba and Dedan are the ancient names of the area, area of modern-day Yemen, Saudi Arabia, the merchants of Tarshish, we really don't know. There's an interesting debate on, upon that. We do know that ancient sailors said that it was the land to the west of Gibraltar in the Atlantic, meaning that it's European. Or some people go even as far as to say that it relates to the United States. But these nations will be standing on the sidelines watching this attack from the north with all of this coalition saying, what are you guys doing? And they're not going to want to be involved with it. They're going to be protesting in the UN, basically saying, no, we're not supportive of this. Which is interesting in, in light of what is happening right now in the Middle East with Saudi Arabia. And the, this Islamic nation, which has historically not been a friend of Israel, all of a sudden is looking to Israel and going, hey, 
we could use a little help in our defense. We could use a little help and have a, have a little coalition of our own here. Why? Because Saudi Arabia is no friend of Iran. Saudi Arabia has been in negotiations with Israel and is willing to fund Israel and give them what they need in order to fight Iran because the Saudis don't want Iran to develop the nuclear bomb because they know if they do and they use it on Israel, they're going to come and use it on them too. So it's a weird alliance that's going on. Yesterday, the general secretary um, Halavi, Herzog Halavi, Israeli's chief of staff said, Iran has made more progress in enriching uranium than ever before. Let that sink in. All of the years that they've been doing uranium development, they've made more progress in enriching it just recently than ever before. And there are negative developments on the horizon that could lead to action. We have capabilities. Others also have capabilities. Do you see the... Th the underlying threat. If you think for a second you can use those nuclear, those bombs on us, we got our own. So the United States, we can use them on you. First might even be the implication. I don't know. People in the world scratch their heads and say, why would a Muslim nation want to help Israel fight another Muslim nation? But most people don't understand the hatred between the Shia Muslims that dominate Iran and the Sunni Muslims that dominate Saudi Arabia. And the Sunni Muslims know that if Iran is successful in building that bomb and destroying Israel, they're going to come after them next. So, and Saudi Arabia is one of the ones on the line saying, what are you guys doing? Why are you attacking them? Bring that into our context of what's going on in our world today. We're seeing this happen. This is happening now. It's not something that, well, maybe in 20 years, they might form an alliance with Israel. They're doing it right now. So you can interpret verse, th verse 13 as Saudi Arabia uh, being supportive of Israel along with some of these other nations and perhaps even the U.S. saying, hey, why are you attacking from the north, which is really scary, instead of being along the side of Israel and saying, we're right here with you, we'll fight with you. But if if the United States is referred to there in verse 13, it means that we no longer have the power to defend Israel or no longer the willingness. And since there's been a change in the United States and the leadership, we've seen a lack of willingness from many people in Washington to come alongside Israel and support them. I hope that changes. And I think it could change. There's no way that we can know that any of this is gonna happen in the next three years. But there's no way of knowing that it can't because all of these things are lining up. Verse 14, therefore prophesy, son of man, and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel are living securely, you will know it. Russia today, as well as all these nations mentioned here, know very well that Israel is living securely. They, they, do not, they don't, don't live peaceably, but they live securely, financially, militarily. And as I mentioned earlier, Israel just announced the yearly income of their people are going up. The economy is doing well. So their future is looking bright. As far as Israel's military and security go, well, people in the world know that they're some of the best trained fighters, if not the best trained fighters in the world. And most people know that they have the sufficient number of missiles and aircraft and ships, along with some nuclear bombs that we're not supposed to know about or that don't exist, and some nuclear subs that don't really exist that we're not supposed to know about, but probably do. And the nations wishing to destroy Israel knows that if they try and come against them, Israel will use them. They, ha they will have to use them. Verse 15 says, you will come from a place out of the remote parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great assembly and a mighty army, and you will come against my people Israel like a cloud and to cover the land. It shall come about in the last days that I'll bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am sanctified through you before their eyes. O Gog, thus says the Lord God, you are the one whom I spoke in former days through my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days for many years that I would bring you against them. It will come about in that day 
when God comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God that my fury will mount up in my anger, my, in my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I will declare that on the day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, and all the creeping things that creep on the earth and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains also will be thrown down. The steep pathways will collapse and every wall will fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. So Gog will attack from the north. That's why many people are still pretty convinced it's Russia that they're for the land of the north. But they're going to attack not only from the north, from the east, the south, and the west. Surrounding Israel with the expectation of this Israel easy victory. Israel... Um, you guys in the military, forgive me if I get the number completely not quite right, but from my reading, has about a half a million active soldiers, about 200,000 or so reserves in the Israeli army against these combined armies that are coming against them in the millions. The millions are going to come. And you get to decide how many when we get to chapter 39 when you find out how many die there in, in broad terms. Try to imagine a half a million soldiers being surrounded on all sides by multiple millions and millions of soldiers with all of their armaments and supposedly all their rockets. But as verse 18 says, this will only cause God's fury to rise up. God's gonna go, you think you can take on my nation, my people, and it will begin to shake the land of Israel beneath their feet. I think that's a literal shaking. The attacking armies are going to end up, turn up, turn around fighting each other somehow. Verse 22 says, and it might be, in verse 22 might be an insight to why these guys end up shooting each other. Verse 22 says, with pestilence and with blood will enter, I will enter into judgment with them and I will rain on, on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire and brimstone. Visibly, <laughs> these people are going to be sh- shaking in their boots. What they're going to be experiencing is something they've never experienced. They thought they were going to fight with, ro- with rockets and missiles and guns. And they're, they're fighting against the earth, which is throwing rain and fire at them and, and shaking under their feet. And the visibility, you can imagine, be reduced greatly with torrential rain, hailstones mixed with fire with it. And you can see how these armies are going to be conf- completely confused, stuck in the mud. And they're going to shoot at anything they can see. Verse 23 says, I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, make myself known in the sight of many nations and they will know that I am the Lord. So rather than letting Israel win through their superior fighting, God says, no, no, no. You guys don't need to mobilize the troops. I'm just gonna intervene. And what's he gonna do? He's gonna magnify, he's gonna sanctify, he's gonna make himself known to the world. And this is what's gonna wake up the world. And this could be the thing that that begins the world to say, wait a minute, we got this whole thing about God wrong. Look what's going on over in Israel. They're getting, something's going on, supernatural. Look at what's happening with these armies fighting against Israel, just like happened in 1948, 73, 84. All those were supernatural interventions, but most people just weren't paying attention because there wasn't enough shaking going on. There's going to be a lot of shaking when this happens. Now, real quick in chapter 39, if I can pull this off in a whole four minutes. Um, in chapter 39, we're going to see how God wipes out the rest of the attacking troops. Verse 1 and 2, And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. I am going to turn around, drive you on, take you up from the remotest parts of the north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. So this is God telling Magog, Your days are numbered. I'm bringing my judgment upon you. You are going to be judged for challenging me and challenging my holiness because my holiness is now being displayed, is being magnified through my people. And so God was going to force these armies to come attack, pull pull them down with the hook in the jaw. And he was going to deal with them on the mountains of Israel, a term you used back in verse eight, in chapter 38. They're going to be wiped out. Verse three, I will strike your bow from your left hand and dash down your arrows from your right hand. Men who know Hebrew well tell us that the bow means a launcher 
And an arrow can be defined as a long shaft, so it's not hard to see how he's, in Ezekiel's mind, these terms could easily be describing modern-day missiles, modern-day warfare, their launchers. And Israel, believe it or not, even has a certain class of missiles they call the arrow. And it would seem from the text that God is going to cause Russia's missiles that they have aimed at Israel to fail to launch. The launchers are not going to launch them. And are these going to be nuclear? We don't know. But it's interesting, if they are attempting to launch nuclear missiles at, at Israel and they fail to launch or God destroys them in midair, or maybe even Israel knocks them out of the sky, you can be sure that Israel is going to launch a counterattack. And what most people don't realize, at least people that aren't highly trained like you guys in the military, but um, is that Israel has tactical nukes that affect small areas, neutron bombs that can kill people but not destroy buildings. So Israel could take out millions of soldiers advancing on them with well-placed tactical nukes if they wanted to. And that's a big, big if that's the way God chose to do it because <laughs> Israel will be setting off nuclear detonations in their own country. That doesn't seem like a very feasible solution to their problem, but it does illustrate that this is going to be a major attack upon Israel with these, with these bows and these launchers, these arrows coming at them. And, um, and what I think is interesting is that God will confuse the guidance systems of these missiles probably and have them land on each other rather than on Israel because in Ezekiel 38 it says every man's sword will be against his brother. And I think it's a fair assessment that that is that sword of Islam, especially with Islam, they, they love the symbolism of the sword. Now they're going to come and, and just take out Israel. So I'm seeing this as possibly their missiles are, are misfiring pretty bad and they're wiping each other out. You will fall in the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and your people who are with you. I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and every beast of the field, and you will fall on the open field. For it is I who have spoken, declares the Lord. However it happens, one thing is for sure, there's going to be a great, great slaughter. 90% of the attacking soldiers will be killed on the mountains of Israel, and there will be so many dead in the battlefield the bodies will be a feast for the birds and the animals of the field. And verse six says, and I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands of safety and they will know that I am the Lord, my holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel and I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Again, if this is the idea of nuclear exchange makes sense, I mean, if it's, if it's even in this scenario, fire is not limited to just <coughs> fire that we know of. Fire can be representation of any combustion that's taking place with the presence of oxygen. And in a, a nuclear explosion, that's a lot of fire. <laughs> that's a lot of fire. And God will use Israel perhaps uh, or Russia to launch these things that are going to come and, uh, and destroy an enormous amount of people of these invading armies. Now, the other perspective is that God himself is just going to rain down hailstones, on the, the hailstones on fire. I'm, I'm all over that. I'm going, you know, he did that with Joshua. He did that with the invading armies in the Old Testament. You know, he, he used brimstone in verse 22 in the last chapter. And here these are going to be hailstones with fire raining down and killing the soldiers. And it's interesting, I was watching a, a Discovery uh, documentary where they found ice with methane in them and you can light that ice on fire and you can toss it and it is, and it is an a ice ball. And what's so intriguing about all this is that when God brings judgment, this is judging these lands that are coming against the holiness of God and profaning God saying, we don't want to believe in you. We don't want to follow you. And so people that blaspheme against God in the Old Testament, how were they dealt with? They were stoned to death. And so it wouldn't surprise me that it's God who's bringing these fiery stones from heaven, fire being a, a, a symbol of judgment from heaven down upon these people. So this is, this is the strong hand of God. Verse eight says, behold, I am, it is coming. It shall be done, declares the Lord. 
this is the day which I have spoken. Israel had always been used to God pronouncing the judgments upon them. These captives are finally going, wow, God's gonna protect us. He's gonna bring his judgment upon all those who have blasphemed and told us that we do not serve the holy and living God. Now, again, this is gonna be an interesting time because God is gonna be proclaiming himself in our time, in our future, and making himself known in our future. And Israel's gonna have to wake up to the fact that they rejected his son. And this is why I believe this is happening right at the beginning of the tribulation. Because God's gonna come in and say, I'm not done with you, Israel. I'm not done with you. I am God. But we have some reckoning to do with you because Israel's gonna go into the time of tribulation and they are gonna suffer too of the, for, for their rejection of Jesus. But right now God is dealing with the rejection of the world to his holiness. And just as God was a wall of protection to the Jews during this time, during this time of the Ezekiel war, he's gonna protect them and overwhelm the army and, and do an amazing thing and wipe out 90% of these armies without the Israeli army having to do much of anything at all. I believe he will be more than a wall of protection for us, the church, because I, will, I believe that he will be a refuge from the storm. He will be the one who takes us out of here. We will be raptured. If the timeline is right, we become raptured at the beginning of this, right as this war is beginning. I believe there's never been a time greater in the history of the world where we could see these verses and, and look at them and go, you know, we need to take this seriously because all of the markers are there. And all of the stuff that's going on in the Middle East, it's explaining Ezekiel 38 and 39. And so why do I love prophecy so much? Because I see it happening in our day. I see it being fulfilled in our day. I saw it with a bunch of crazy Christians telling me, hey, you should trust what the Bible says. You should believe your Bible. If it says it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Why can't it happen in your day? And so I look at this stuff and I go, wow, if this is all about to happen, I'm gonna go home pretty soon. I better think a little more seriously about what I'm doing with the time I have left in my own life. I feel that this message was really meant to be a follow-up to Sunday's teacher, teaching by, by Pastor Rick because he, was, he hit it spot on. If, if we begin to realize that there's no time left to be just transactional in our church experience, I think was the word he used, we need to be, decide to be relational in our relationship with the Lord and with other people. We need to be engaged in our Christian lives and not just Christians sitting on the sideline and saying, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm good with prophecy, but I'm, I'm planning my 401 and my retirement and, and I've got a big future and I'm gonna travel the world. And I'm gonna do a lot of things. And, and obviously may not happen for a hundred years. I understand that. None of us know the day of the hour when the Lord's coming for us, but everything is there. It's all about to take place. And knowing this is not meant to scare us. It's just meant to prepare us, maybe even propel us forward in our worship of God and service to him rather than going, you know what? I'm just bummed out. COVID ruined my business. COVID did this and I got depressed and I'm upset with the policies, the policies and the politics and I'm just gonna not do anything. You know, I'm done. I'm done burned out. But what I'm hoping is that we see this and you go, no, 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 wait a minute. We're right on the verge of going home. So maybe what we should do is rethink our strategy and think what God wants to do in us and through us so that we can be a holy vessel and we can bring honor and glory to our God. See, the last thing that God really wanted to do, the thing that he really was hoping to do with through all of this really was bring glory to his name. I mean, his, his ultimate purpose in bringing about this war so that the whole world would wake up and go, there is a holy God. <laughs> there is a holy, um, I, you know, many of us came out of the world where we, it took quite a while for somebody to sit down and share the Lord where it got to the point where we go, I think he is real. And it usually takes an experience where you come humbly before God and you realize I, I'm dealing with a holy God. 
And this is the reason why the judgment comes, why the protection of Israel comes, the restoration of Israel. And we see the, all of these things going on so God could be magnified. So that God could show the world that he is a holy God and he cares for those that he has called out of this world. He chose Israel in the beginning. And he's going to continue to protect them. And he's going to continue to provide. And they're all going to come to know him. Or all Israel's going to come to know him in the tribulation. Once they have to deal with their rejection. But the church were his bride. And he's going to bring glory to his name by taking us home. And so I'm encouraged by this. And I'm thankful that God is, has allowed us to live in a time, the most exciting time I think that, that there is in the history of the world. We all think about how it'd be cool to live when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee, but how much cool he's going to be when he comes back for us and we meet him in the air. So I praise God for that, and I praise God for the work he's doing. The pastor's conference was amazing, where we got the same kind of push with these pastors. A number of them said the same things. Guys, we're right there, right at the end. Keep looking up. Keep your faith strong, and don't let the world pull you down and don't let it bum you out. Get your focus back where you can be relational in your relationship with the Lord, relation with the people in the church and be useful and be a holy vessel for him. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time that we get to spend in your word. God, there's so much here, but we know that you're revealing these things little by little. You're showing us these truths. My prayer, God, is that for those that have been discouraged in their walks and those that may have just been bogged down because of their responsibilities, they would now get to the point in their, in their walks where they could just catch on fire. Like Pastor Mark said, they just come alive and say, God, you're good. We don't deserve any of this. We don't deserve to be living in this time when we know you're coming, but God, fill us. Fill us to overflowing with your spirit. Give us the ability God, to be useful. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Use us, God, for the time that we have left. In Jesus' name, amen.